Hey guys, let's look at an actual opinion from December 23 of 2021. This is from the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. It's a Fair Credit Reporting Act case. So somebody was trying to make some changes to their credit report and they weren't satisfied with what happened. So they sued. And in this particular case, the district court, the trial judge threw the case out and the 11th Circuit says, we agree with that. So I want us to see exactly what happened. And then also see, well, what lessons can we learn from this? Is it all negative? Are there some positive lessons we can pull from this? So let's, i tell you what, I'll, I'll start off talking about this. It says, do not publish. So this is really kind of a legacy thing. So back in the day when I first started practicing law, which was like, I don't know, in 1920 or something, we had law books and the opinions would be published in those books. Now, you know, it wasn't literally 1920, it might've been 1930. I don't know. I've been practicing a long time, but we did have, you know, electronic stuff, but by and large things were in books. And so sometimes the court would say, you know what, we don't want this published in the books. It's still a valid opinion between the parties, but nobody really was supposed to know about the opinion or use it. That has sort of lost a lot of its meaning now. And different courts have different rules on this, whether you're supposed to cite a, quote, unpublished opinion or not. But the reality is, this is what the 11th Circuit has said. And while they can change their mind in a future case, this does give us some insight. And in whether we view this case as a good case or a bad case for consumers or credit bureaus or whoever, still, it needs to be studied. So I think it's worth our time to look at. So here's what happened. We've got this consumer and she looks at her Equifax and TransUnion reports and the Wells Fargo trade line or what we would just call an account says she disputes it. And so she then sends a letter to Equifax and TransUnion saying, I do not dispute the account. So it's incorrect what you're reporting when you say it's disputed Really, it's not disputed. And so Equifax and TransUnion then forward that letter to Wells Fargo, which they're supposed to do, and say, what do you think about this dispute? And it says, because Wells Fargo had not received any word from the consumer, she no longer disputed the trade line. Wells Fargo's records indicated the trade line was still in dispute. And so they told, Wells Fargo told that to Equifax and TransUnion. And so that leaves the dispute not uh, notation or notification on the, the credit reports. Now, let's just stop here for a second. When we let a furnisher know that we dispute the account, and we're not going to go into all the details, but typically they're supposed to mark that on our credit report as disputed. Well, that can have good and bad effects. Okay, Positive effect can be, that a lot of times the scoring algorithms, the scoring models, credit scoring models, skip over accounts that are marked with being disputed. Now, the negative is mortgage companies and other companies know this. And so if you're applying for credit, a lot of times they say, we will not approve you if you have any accounts that are marked as disputed. Okay, Because their concern is that people would just dispute things that are not legitimate to dispute just to get rid of negative stuff and raise their score. Okay. Now, again, not the purpose of this video talking about whether that's true or not true or anything like that, but just understand that's kind of the, the, the battleground we have here. And what the credit bureaus are doing is they are pushing these furnishers. Furnishers are people that provide information to credit bureaus to say, we want you to to get rid of these dispute notations or change them to say was in dispute now resolved, even though the consumer hasn't said that. So this case, even though the consumer loses, I think can be very helpful in future cases. So let's keep going. So when she sees that, Hey, my Wells Fargo account still shows disputed, she sued and the district court, again, that's the trial judge in federal court dismissed the suit and said, hey, Wells Fargo satisfied its obligations, and the 11th Circuit agreed, so they affirmed the case. If they disagreed, they would reverse the case. So let's look at the letter. And the court's going to be pretty critical of this letter. It certainly is not the way I would recommend to do a dispute letter, but let's see what's happening here. 
So, dear whoever, and then there's an X that says, you know, this applies. There are things that do not belong on my credit report for the following below reason on the below account. It's a little awkwardly worded, okay? But I think it's pretty clear what it's saying. Hey, here's a list of accounts. And then if you look below that list, you'll see why I disagree with things. Again, not the way I would recommend doing it. I think you ought to identify the account and then right there identify whatever's inaccurate, whatever's incomplete. But this is the letter that was submitted. And the reason that stuff is inaccurate is I no longer dispute the above accounts. Okay. So, Miss White does not allege she ever told Wells Fargo directly that she no longer disputed the trade line. Let me stop there. There have been a bunch of these lawsuits filed, and federal judges, district court judges, have started to say that, well, you have to notify the furnisher directly and say, hey, I don't dispute anymore, before you can then dispute through the credit bureaus. Now, the 11th Circuit doesn't go quite that far, but they certainly suggest that that would be a good thing to do. Maybe it's not a requirement. So just keep that in mind as we go through. Her complaint says only she sent the CRAs, the credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion. In this particular case, Equifax and TransUnion. She sent Equifax and TransUnion a letter stating that they were wrong in reporting the Wells Fargo trade line was in dispute. And so they forwarded her dispute to Wells Fargo. And Wells Fargo verified to the bureaus that according to its records, the trade line was still disputed. The point here is if you dispute a trade line, it stays in dispute until you tell the furnisher it's no longer in dispute. This will help us in other cases because again, there's this trend of companies going, oh, well, it's no longer in dispute. It's like, well, excuse me, did I tell you it was no longer in dispute? No, no, no. We're just the furnisher, the credit card company, whoever. We just decided it's no longer in dispute. This opinion is going to be a problem for those companies doing that. All right, so back to the text here. She obtained new credit reports. They showed the Wells Fargo account was still disputed. So she says, you, Wells Fargo, you negligently or willfully failed to investigate my dispute and remove the dispute notation. And Wells Fargo says... We don't even need to get to discovery, depositions, anything like that. You know, trial judge, you can just look at the complaint, the lawsuit, and see there's no way that, that she can win and throw the case out. And that's what the court did. And this section two, we're not going to go over it. This just gives the standard for dismissing a lawsuit under Federal Rule Civil Procedure 12B6. All right, let's go to section three. And now this is just a conclusion. Because Wells Fargo met its obligations, district court properly dismissed the consumer's complaint. Okay, well, why do you say that? The FCRA requires furnishers like Wells Fargo to investigate disputed information, reviewing all relevant information provided by the credit bureau in connection with the dispute. That's part of the FCRA, 15 U.S.C. 1681 S2B. And this is what's known as furnisher liability. And the court says, we've said reasonableness, because that's the question, is that's the, the big thing here is, was it a reasonable investigation? And that depends in part on the documentation available to the furnisher. And they cite this Hinkle versus Midland Credit. Pretty sure I did a video on that. If I can remember, I'll link to it. But otherwise, just search my channel and you'll find it. I think it's a pretty lengthy video, uh, pretty long opinion, but a very important opinion. So here, the consumer does not plausibly allege that they failed to conduct a reasonable investigation. All right. Well, why? Well, she had previously disputed the trade line, but she had not resolved the dispute with Wells Fargo by the time she sent the letter to the credit bureau stating she no longer disputed the trade line. So the plain import of the letter to the bureaus is that the bureau's reports were inaccurate. Well, why were they inaccurate? Not that she was thereby resolving or trying to resolve a dispute with her bank, okay? But just saying it's inaccurate what you're reporting. That can kind of make your head hurt a little bit. So her credit report says Wells Fargo disputed by consumer. She then disputes to the bureaus saying the dispute notation is inaccurate, so investigate my dispute of the dispute notation. There's a couple ways you can view that. So let's see 
what happens here. Oh, let me uh, get this part here. Uh, they, they do point out Wells Fargo was not did not receive the letter directly. Now they received it from the credit bureaus, but they're saying, well, you didn't mail it directly to the bank. So she argues her statement that she no longer disputed, that's all you need to know, credit bureaus. That's all you need to know, Wells Fargo. In other words, hey, if I tell you it's wrong to show it as disputed, that means you should take the dispute notation off. But here's what the Eleventh Circuit says. But when the credit bureaus forwarded her letter, Wells Fargo reasonably understood it as a request by the bureaus to verify that their reporting, in other words, Equifax and TransUnion's reporting, about the status of her account matched the status of the account in Wells Fargo's official bank records. And so the reasonable thing to do was check its records. And that's what Wells Fargo did. They checked their records, said, well, it says disputed. So they report back to the bureaus as disputed. Now here's where the court says, well, let's think about what else Wells Fargo could have done. They could have contacted the consumer to say, hey, are you attempting to resolve that underlying dispute? They said they could have done that, but that better practice is not what the FCRA requires. And then they cite a Seventh Circuit opinion that says, We're not going to make every furnisher automatically, under all circumstances, contact every single consumer and talk to them about the dispute. Now, that's not saying they never have to contact the consumer. It's just saying we're not going to make them do it all the time. And so here's the 11th Circuit, what we've got highlighted. What the consumer wants to do, one of two things, either number one, intuit she no longer disputed the trade line from her, it says report, but it'd be her her letter to the bureaus. Um. And I think that's actually a pretty reasonable interpretation, but that's not what the Eleventh Circuit decides here. Or number two, reach out to her directly to clarify and confirm she no longer wish to dispute. That goes beyond what the FCRA reasonableness requires. Okay, so again, number one is, hey Wells Fargo, I want you to to make the conclusion that I must not dispute the trade line. Uh, and kind of two ways you can read this, from her report, in other words, from my Equifax report, my TransUnion report, or they may be trying to say, hey, Wells Fargo, I want you to understand for the fact that I'm sending a letter to the bureaus that says I don't want a dispute notation on there, that that means I've resolved the dispute. They disagree with that. I think that could have gone either way, but they did not agree with that. And they say, and we're definitely not going to make Wells Fargo call you to say, hey, Do you no longer want to dispute this? So let's look at what may have sort of influenced the court here. The letter that the consumer sent is far from clear. To start the form letter, nothing wrong with the form letter, but they point out that this is a form letter. It's addressed to dear whoever. Evidently, they didn't particularly like that. I would recommend you put dear Equifax or, you know, dear Experian or or list, you know, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, dear sir or madam, you know, instead of just kind of like dear whoever. Okay, I don't think that changed the result, but it sounds like the court wasn't impressed with that. And then the court says the letter is contradictory. I'm not sure I agree with this, but let's see what the court says here. The first part of the letter seems to dispute certain things belong on her credit report and then list the Wells Fargo trade line. Well, that's true, but... What the letter is saying is, here are the accounts that have some things that are wrong with them. Wells Fargo trade line. And then if you look below, it'll tell you what's wrong with it. Then the second part says she no longer disputes the above accounts and asks CRAs to remove all disputed comments from the above account. So the court reads that as being contradictory. I personally don't, but you know I wasn't wearing the black robes in this case. So what's important is what the 11th Circuit says here. This teaches us an important point. We want our dispute letters to the credit bureaus to be clear, to be clean, to be understandable. We don't want them to be vague, ambiguous. We want it so that there's no possible way to misinterpret it. Because here, I think the court could have viewed this letter another way, but because it's a little bit vague or ambiguous, or maybe it could be viewed contradictory, That's the route that the court went. 
and then the letter on its face fails to make anything clear to Wells Fargo, much less that she expected Wells Fargo to remove the dispute notation. So the letter does not say, to be clear, I'm asking you and Wells Fargo to remove the dispute notation because I no longer dispute anything about my Wells Fargo account. Maybe if it had been written that way, the court would have ruled differently. We'll have to see. And this is part of what understanding case law and being a lawyer is all about is we look and see, well, what did the court say? What are they kind of hinting at here? What do other decisions say? And where would I predict that the court would go if we change this detail or that detail? All right, so let's go back. Now, they reference a case that we put up a video on, I'm almost positive, last year called Loesch versus NationStar. This was a what's called a post-bankruptcy. So you file bankruptcy, you get a discharge, and then the credit reporting is inaccurate. And it's a great opinion in a lot of ways. And they really hammer the credit bureau who says, oh, well, it's too complicated to figure out what these court orders mean. They're like, well, go figure it out. All right, but here's the quote. Even when consumers inform the agency, that would be the credit bureau, about inaccurate information, there may be circumstances, say, when the consumer supplies insufficient detail. So let's go back. There may be circumstances in which there's no jury question about the reasonableness of the agency's investigation or reinvestigation. So they're saying, look, if your dispute letter is lacking in detail, or if it's contradictory, or if it's confusing, or it's vague, or it's ambiguous, then you may give an out. You may give sort of an off-ramp here to the credit bureaus and to the furnishers to keep false information on your credit report, but you can't sue them for that. So what's the lesson? Make our dispute letters so clear, so precise that there can be no misinterpretation of them. All right, let's go back here. Miss White could have written a, le- a better letter, one that made clear she was attempting to revoke her dispute for the first time, or better yet, one addressed to the bank itself. Now, again, I think I mentioned a lot of trial judges in federal court are saying, well, you have to reach out directly to the furnisher to remove a dispute notation before you dispute through the credit bureau. That's not what the 11th Circuit's saying. They're saying that would be better, but it says you could have just made it clear you're attempting to revoke the dispute notation. Or better yet, have the letter addressed to the bank itself, but that is not the letter on which the consumer sued, so they affirm. So, again, what, what's the take home? Make our dispute letters very, very, very clear. Okay. read them, say, you know, is this confusing? Is this ambiguous? Could this be interpreted multiple different ways? Because certainly whoever you sue is going to take the most ridiculous interpretation of your letter. And you don't know what the judge is going to do. And then if the judge goes against you, now you have to potentially appeal it. And now you have three more judges looking at it well, do you want the letter to be uh, worded in a way that they're like, well, you know, we could see how this could be confusing or ambiguous, or or do you want them to say, man, this letter is crystal clear? So that would be my suggestion for you. Make the letter very clear, very clean. Uh, if you want some help in this, we have a six-part webinar series, probably an hour each webinar. It's totally free. Uh, that goes through, how do you find errors? How do you dispute errors? How do you word your dispute letter? Uh, Just reach out to me uh, through my website, alabamaconsumer.com. My name is John Watts. I may not have said my name at the beginning of this, but I'm a consumer protection lawyer. And just reach out to me through my website. I'll be glad to send you the links to all that. And uh, just make it crystal clear what you're disputing, and that will go a long ways towards helping you. All right. Thanks for watching this video and I'll catch you in the next one, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.